Amen. First Samuel chapter number 30. First Samuel chapter number 30, verses 1 through 8. In my mind, I thought, I'm going to just stand here till somebody says something or makes a noise. <laughs> and uh, it was so quiet. Cool. There you go. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag, on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. And every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Amen. Amen. And David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam, Ahinoam and Abigail. Ahinoam and Abigail. I want to preach for a while this morning, recovering Ahinoam and Abigail. Lord, I thank you for your people, for this great crowd, Lord, that have come today to worship you. I pray, God, that you would anoint me to preach your word, anoint ears to hear. Faith comes by hearing, so help us to hear your word. Let it bring faith to the heart and the spirit and the mind of your people. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would confirm your word with signs following. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost destroy every yoke in this place. And we ask it to be done in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. The story of David is one of the most riveting of the ancient world. It is very often the subject of many sermons and songs. David is a musician and a poet and a songwriter, a shepherd, a warrior, and a king. He, possesses, he possessed tremendous traits and devastating weaknesses. He's a hero and a villain in his own biography. He had moments that men only dream of, defeating lions and bears and giants and armies and a coronation as a king over Israel. His ears heard the song of the maidens as they sang in his honor and of his great victories. Along with those amazing heights, David also had terrible low places. His daughter is raped by her own brother. Another son starts a war against him. He commits terrible sins. He loses a baby in the first few weeks of its life. David is a man of contrasts. He's a worshiper and an adulterer. He's a prophet and a conspirator. He's a king and a killer. 
In some ways, David is like every man, and in other ways, there's no one else like him. There's such a wide range of stories about this man's life that David is almost, that, that in the life of David, almost everyone can find a bit of themselves somewhere in his life. David spent about a year and a half as a fugitive in the land that was controlled by the Philistines. He had already been anointed by Samuel to be the next king, but he was living like anything but a king at this point. Saul resented David's anointing and hated him for it. During a portion of this period of time, David was given the village of Ziklag as a place of refuge by the Philistine king of Gath. It was during this time that David and his warriors had gone from Ziklag armed for war. They left their families in the village while they were away. And during their absence on the third day, the Amalekites came and captured their wives, their sons, and their daughters. And the Bible said they burned Ziklag with fire. As David and his men approached home, they could see the smoke of the fire on the horizon. By the time they got back and saw the ashes and the smoldering remains of their homeland, of their village, they got more and more apprehensive as they realized that all of their families were now missing and their homes destroyed. The Bible said that they were overcome with grief. 1 Samuel 30 and 4 said, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. What a melancholy passage of Scripture. I find it interesting that the Bible did not say they lifted up their voices and wept. For they were as united in grief as anyone could possibly be. They lifted up their voice and wept. Have you ever wept until tears just wouldn't flow anymore? Wept until you just couldn't muster another tear. The grief was there. The wailing was there. But you've cried until your eyes are dry. And there's no more power to weep. One of the most exhausting things there is to the human body is grief. As was customary in the ancient world, and we find in this scripture, David had more than one wife. The Bible mentions two of them by name in this particular passage of scripture. The Bible mentions Ahinoam and Abigail as being taken captive from Ziklag. I find it interesting. I know we know from later on in this passage that there were at least 600 men in David's company, fighting men in David's company, which means there were more than 600 wives taken and an unknown number of children. Yet of all that host of hundreds, the Bible only mentions these two as being taken captive at Ziklag, Ahinoam and Abigail. The situation was bad for David. The Bible said in verse number 6, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. David was greatly distressed. I'll tell you that when there's trouble, nobody carries it, the weight of it more than the leader. The people were going through difficult times, but instead of being angry at the Amalekites, they took their anger out on David. Here they're in great danger because though God sympathized with their plight, David was his anointed man. 
And God defends his anointed. He defends them against lions. He defends them against bears. He defends them against giants. And he'll defend them against these men if that's what he has to do. They were very close in their grief and in their sorrow to taking the position of an enemy of God and his anointed man. David taught everyone a valuable lesson that day. When the Bible said that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He didn't go looking for allies. He didn't go looking for someone to cry on their shoulder. But he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He went to God and God alone. And it was from his relationship with God that David found strength and hope. Praise God. Y'all with me? Amen. Sometimes I have long introductions and short short sermons. Sometimes I have short introductions and short sermons. And sometimes I have long introductions and long sermons. And it's yet to be determined which one this is. In the Bible, names mean something. In today's world... In today's world, people pick names because they like them, the sound of them, or they think they sound cool. I have a minister friend whose wife was a public school teacher, and she had twin boys in her class, and one's name was Lamangelo, and the other was Orangelo. And when you look at it on paper, it's lemon jello and orange jello. That's not how it was in Bible days. In the Bible days, names meant something. The meaning of the names of David's two wives in this passage of Scripture became very interesting to me when I realized that of all the hundreds of people taken captive, only these two were mentioned by name. The definition of the name Ahinoam, It means my brother is delight. It means to find pleasure or to have joy in your brother, your brethren. But it's more than just your your, your brother or brethren, but it extends to your entire kin, your whole family, and to your entire tribe. And so a Hinoam means to find joy in my tribe or in my family, in my brethren. It means to have good relations and delight with those to whom you are associated with. The enemy took pleasantness and joy from the brotherhood and from the tribe out of David's life. I will tell you this morning that one of the things the devil would like to do to the church is to remove the joy and pleasure of being with your brothers and sisters, your kinship, and your tribe. Amen. He wants you to not have joy in the fellowship of your spiritual tribe, your church family. It has always been the devil's desire to isolate and divide God's people. He'll do anything he can, use anything he can, use anyone he can to steal a Hinoham out of the tribe of David. He'll use whatever means he has to to cause somebody to have a wedge driven between them and their church family, their brother, their sister, their kin, their tribe. He wants to steal the joy of kinship out of the family of the living God. Amen. You don't have to say amen, but I know I'm preaching the truth right now. My brothers and sisters, if you have repented of your sins, been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and been filled with the Holy Ghost, we are the same tribe. We may not look alike. We may not dress alike, we may not sing alike, we may not talk alike, but we've got the same blood and the same spirit. We are the same kinship of the family of God. You are my brother and my sister. We are the tribe of the Lord in this day and age. Somebody say praise the Lord. I'll tell you that the devil wants to steal a Hinoam out of the church of the living God. He's against unity and brotherhood 
and peace. He'll do anything he can to divide people and separate people. Okay, I'm going to preach it. Amen. The devil's against unity. Let me preach to our young folks for a minute. Can I do that? Let me tell our young folks that he'll do what he can to get these paired up against these and these against these and these over here against these. Anything he can to take a Hinoham out of our kinship, the joy of the fellowship. Amen. I'm going to preach a minute here. Amen. One of the weapons of the enemy comes to us in Proverbs 16 and 28. The Bible said, a froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth cheap, cheap friends. Amen. I started to say cheap friends. Amen. If somebody can gossip and make you not like your friend, it was a cheap friendship to start. Amen. But let me continue. The ESV version of this same verse, a dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. Let me tell our young folks, and not just our young folks, but everybody, that if somebody comes to you sowing discord about somebody else, don't listen to it. Don't listen to it. If they start the conversation with, I'm not talking about somebody, but they're lying, they're gossiping, don't listen to it. Amen. Don't let the enemy steal Ohinoham out of the tribe of the living God. We have to fight for your brother and your sister. You got to fight for your spiritual family. You got to fight for each other. Stand with each other. Amen. Somebody say, preach, pastor. You have to fight for it. It is, look, look, let me, let me just tell our, I, I wish our kids were in here too. Maybe we can tell them when they get out of children's church. But, uh, but you, 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 if it's not nice and it's not uplifting and it's not encouraging, then keep your mouth shut. Praise God. Do I have any moms and dads say, preach to my kids, help them? Do I have any kids saying, preach to my mom and dad, help them? The devil knows if he can get your joy that you're weaker. Amen. Well, glory. Learning to be quiet is a skill. Proverbs 26 and 20, where no wood is. There the fire goeth out. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no talebearer, the strife seetheth. Amen. We don't have room for cliques in a youth group or any other group. Amen. If it's not positive, don't speak it. If it's not a compliment, don't say it. If it's not to build each other up, don't talk about it. It's nobody's business what's going on in somebody's family, in somebody's home. Amen. We got to fight to keep a Hinoham in the family of God. We got to keep the brotherhood together. Amen. Don't let the enemy take your tribe and separate it. Can I preach a few more minutes here? Amen. There is another wife of David mentioned here. I got to hurry up. Amen. It's hunger 30. The second wife of David was Abigail. The name Abigail means my father is joy. It means to have joy, gladness, and rejoicing in my father. My father is joy. Not only did the enemy come and take the joy and pleasure of the brotherhood, but then the enemy came and took the joy from the relationship with the Father out of the family. Amen. Not only does the enemy want to take the pleasure out of your kinship and your brethren, but he wants to kidnap your joy in your heavenly Father. He wants your joy, your gladness, and your rejoicing in your Father. He wants to reduce church to ritual and habit and drudgery. He wants your soul to be dry, passionless, and empty. He knows if he can get your joy that he can weaken you. So he wants to kidnap Abigail out of your out of your heart. He wants to take the joy of your father out of your spirit. I wish I had one person to help me preach right now. Amen. It was Nehemiah that said the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
Without joy, we're weaker. Without joy, we can't fight at optimum place. Without joy, we're not all that we can be. Without joy, we can't achieve all that God wants us to have. We've got to resist the enemy taking Abigail out of our life. we got to resist letting the enemy take the joy of the Father out of my spirit and out of my soul. It was the prophet Joel in chapter number 1 and verse number 12. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Even all, everybody say all. all. Even all the trees of the field are withered. The harvest is withered. The food is gone. How did we get in this condition? What was the cause of the withering of the vine and the fig and the pomegranate and the palm and the apple and all the trees of the field? Because joy is withered away from the sons of men. When the enemy took their joy, he took their harvest. When he took their joy, he took their food. And I'll tell you, if the devil can take your joy, he'll take your spiritual harvest and he'll take your spiritual food. We got to fight for Abigail. We got to go for Abigail. Amen. Oh, God. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. This has been a wild week. This has been a wild week in our nation and in our world. This has been a crazy time in our world. I never thought I would see it to get to the point that it's at. Let me tell you. There's a lot of fear and consternation about what's happening in the world and what's happening in our nation. I will tell you that revival will never come from the sea of fear. That revival will not come from fear of what's happening in the world around us. True revival does not come from dread and fear of the future. Real Holy Ghost revival comes when the church has a restoration of the joy of the Lord. I'm fighting for Abigail this morning. I'm coming after my Abigail this morning. I need Abigail in my life. I need the joy of my father to get back in my, I need to get that relationship back with Abigail. Fear subsides, but joy abides. Fear intimidates, but joy radiates. Fear troubles, but joy bubbles. Fear binds, but joy shines. Fear paralyzes, but joy revitalizes. God, I want my Abigail back. I want my joy back. God, I'm coming after my joy. The enemy's taking it. He's taking Ahinoam, and he's taking Abigail. But I'll serve notice that the church is rising up. There's some Davids rising up. There's some men of praise and war rising up that said, I'm coming after my joy. I'm coming after joy in my fellowship, and I'm coming for the joy of my Father. I wish somebody would praise the Lord right now. Hey, I'm coming after my praise. I'm coming after my worship. I'm coming after my prayer life. I'm coming after my holiness. I'm coming after my relationship with God. I'm coming for my Abigail. I want my relationship with my father back. The enemy has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. Psalms 51, 9 through 12 Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Don't let me act right in church and be a devil outside of church. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Don't let me just shout in here and cuss out there. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Don't let me be a worshiper here and a fighter out there. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Don't let me read the Bible in here and read porn sites out there. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. You don't want me to preach it, but I'm preaching it anyway. God, purify my heart. Purify my heart. Purify my soul. Give me a spiritual mindset. 
Give me strong convictions, God. Let my convictions be stronger than my temptations. Create in me, O God, a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Now notice it says renew a right spirit within me. The word spirit in verse 10 is not capitalized. It's not talking about the spirit of God. It's talking about our human will, our attitude, the way that we act, the way that we treat people, the way that we carry ourselves. Renew a right spirit within me. God, I need you. God, I need you. Before I start worrying about everybody else, I need to worry about me. God created in me a clean heart. Amen. God, before I ask you to worry about somebody else's heart, fix mine first. Before I ask you to fix somebody else's spirit, fix mine first. Create in me. Create in me a clean heart. God, this whole heart needs you. This heart gets mad. This heart gets grumpy. This heart gets frustrated. This heart gets grudges. This heart has problems sometimes. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit. Sometimes my spirit gets wrong. Well, glory. Amen. If you can't say it, your spouse might be able to say it for you. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. I'm going to tell you, the enemy doesn't want your joy restored today. You hear me? The enemy doesn't want your joy restored. If he can get you to wring your hands about all the stuff going on, if he can get you to get so frustrated about everything in your world and everything in your life and overcome with worry and dread and grief and agony, if he can get you focused on other things beside the joy of the Lord, he'll take Abigail right out of your life, right out of your camp, and you'll have nothing but smoldering remains left to look at. But David required of the, inquired of the Lord. He asked God, God, I need you to restore your joy to my life. I wonder if there's anybody that would raise their hand to heaven and say, God, restore joy. Restore joy in my worship. Restore joy in my walk with you. Restore joy in my brotherhood. Restore the joy of the Father in my life. I'm going to tell you, we got to go after Ahinoham and Abigail this morning. Uh, somebody needs to go after their Ahinoham and their Abigail today. David's sin had siphoned his spiritual joy out of his tank. And his transgressions had become a wedge between him and God. But David knew that if his iniquities could be blotted out, he'll have a restoration of joy. I'm going to tell you, it do us all good to remember how to repent. Isaiah 12 and 3, therefore with joy, everybody say with joy, shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Look at what the Apostle Paul said to the Philippian church in Philippians 4 and 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That word always is interesting. It means every win. Every win. W-H-E-N. Every win. Every win. Rejoice in the Lord every win. And again, I say, rejoice. Well, what about when I don't feel good? Every win. What about when I'm struggling? Every win. What about when I'm having troubles and trials? Every win. What about when the world is blowing up all around us? Every win. What about when everything that we hope for looks like it's death? Every win. What are we going to do when our economy struggles? Every win. What am I going to do when the doctor gives me a bad report? Every win. What am I going to do? What am I going to do when I have troubles and trials and tribulations and frustration and weakness and when I go through stuff and I don't even know what I'm going through and why? Every win. Rejoice in the Lord. Every win. Amen. That means now, as a matter of fact. That means right now. That means regardless of what's going on in your life, right now is the right time. It's the win to worship. 
You want to know when the right time to worship is? Every win. Every win. Every win. Every win. Every time. Every day. All the time. Rejoice in the Lord. Because the devil tries to stop it because he knows if he can take your Abigail, he can take your victory. Somebody ought to praise the Lord right now. Somebody ought to praise him right now. Somebody ought to go after their Abigail. Somebody ought to say, you can't have my Ahinoam, and you can't have my Abigail. You can't have my fellowship, and you can't have my father. You can't have my joy. You can't have my joy, devil. You can't have it. Somebody needs to go after it today. I'm almost done. I, I really sincerely believe it. 1 Samuel 30 and 8, and David inquired at the Lord. Everybody say, at the Lord. And David inquired at the Lord. I've quoted this scripture. I mean, you, you, you're not, not a preacher until you preached about Ziklag at least once. I've misquoted this scripture every time I've ever preached about it. I have. I've always said that David inquired of the Lord. It's not what the Bible says. David inquired at the Lord. Young's literal translation says, David asketh at Jehovah. I don't want to dwell on this point too long, but it's interesting to me that the Bible says David inquired at the Lord, not of the Lord. At Jehovah, not of There's a subtle yet profound difference between inquiring of and inquiring at. Because you can inquire of the Lord from anywhere. But you can only inquire at the Lord if you're in his presence. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord for my lead balloon. There's a big difference between inquiring of the Lord and at the Lord. And I find it that even in this most difficult time of David's life, when his Ahinoam and Abigail were taken away, and the men were thinking about stoning David, that he encouraged himself in the Lord his God, that with all that going on, he found his way into the presence of the Lord. Oh God, I'm going to tell you, if stuff and circumstance can keep you out of the presence of God, the devil will make sure you always have stuff and circumstance. If people can keep you out of the presence of God, the devil will always put people in your way. If problems can keep you out of the presence of God, he'll always put problems in your way. But David proved to us that in the midst of problems and in the midst of trial that you can still find your way at the presence of the Lord. I'm telling you, he's here right now. And if you'll worship him, you can inquire at the Lord and not just of the Lord. Amen. You might be going through the darkest time of your life, but you can inquire at the Lord. You can encourage yourself. Somebody ought to just praise him through your trouble, through your heartache, through your weariness, through your pain, through your confusion, through your fear, through your doubt, and just praise him anyway and inquire at the Lord. Oh, somebody ought to praise him right now. Uh, this is it, folks. This, it don't get no better. This is as good as it's going to get right now. Preaching's almost done. Amen. Amen. Whoo, glory to God. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right here. I don't know if it's just in a bubble right around this pulpit or not, but I feel it right here right now. Amen. I'll tell you right now, David inquired at the Lord, and he said, shall I pursue that seems like a silly question to me. Of course you pursue, unless you just don't like them. I mean, shall I pursue? Should I go after my wives or should I just let the enemy have them? I 
I mean, there, there's, I look, listen, men, right now there's danger in the house. You be careful how you act. I'm telling you, there's danger here. Shall I pursue or should I just let them go? Should I go after them or should I just assume the enemy's got them, nothing I can do about it, and just sit here and keep crying? Shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? And, and will, not only should I go after them, but will I get them back? Let me tell you something in life. You'll never catch something you don't pursue. You'll never get something back if you don't go after it. You can say, man, I wish I was close to God again. Man, I wish I had that relationship with God like I had back when. Man, I wish I, wish I could feel God like I did over that time. I wish I had back what I had way back then. I wish I could get my joy back. Let me tell you, you'll never get anything back that you're not willing to go after. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you, that's good preaching for life right now. You'll never get back from the devil what you don't go after. If you let him have your praise, he'll keep your praise forever. If you let him have your worship, he'll keep your worship forever. If you let him have your family, he'll have your family forever. But if you'll pursue, the Lord said, you will per you pursue and you shall without fail recover all. You can get it back. You can get it back. You hear what I'm saying? You can get your joy back. You can get your peace back. You can get your, but you got to go after it. You got to go for it. Look at somebody tell them you got to go for it. You can't sit back and think that it's coming to you because victory doesn't come to where you are. Vic you got to go to where victory is. Victory's not going to come and knock you over. You got to go find victory. You got to stir yourself up. I'm going for a Hinoam, and I'm going for Abigail. I'm coming after my joy. I'm coming after my fellowship, and I'm coming after the joy of, I wish somebody, I wish somebody would step out right now that hadn't shouted in a long time. I wish somebody that you've been living in regret. You've been living in yesterday. You've been hoping and dreaming of yesteryear. I wish you'd stir something up in your soul right now and say, I'm going after Ahinoam and I'm going after Abigail. Oh, yeah. You shall pursue, for you will overtake and without fail recover all. Your best days are behind you. Your best years aren't behind you. Your most exciting victories aren't behind you. They're in front, but you got to pursue. And if you'll pursue, you'll overtake. And if you overtake, you will without fail recover all. I wish somebody would praise him. Oh, come on, lift your hands all over this place. Hallelujah. I want a Hinoham, and I want Abigail back. got them back, they all got their family back. Every goat, every cow, every lamb, every boy, every girl, every plate, every pot. I don't know if they used spoons and forks, but if they did, they got them back. For you shall without fail. When the devil tells you you'll never get it back, you say you are a liar because my Bible tells me without fail. When you feel like you'll never have joy again, you say, devil, you're lying to me. You're not the gatekeeper of my joy. You don't hold it in your hands. 
You're not the arbiter of my joy. You're not the possessor of my joy. You don't have the right to tell me I can't enjoy my life living for God. I rebuke you, devil, in Jesus' name. You better get behind me. I'm coming after my Aunt Hinoham, and I'm coming after my Abigail. And without fail, I, I wish uh, somebody ought to somebody ought to just scream right now. Y'all do something. You got to go after it. You got to go after it. Doesn't matter if they sing. Doesn't matter if I preach. You got to go after it. You got to you got to worship. You got to pray. You got to lift your voice. You got to lift your hands. I lose deliverance in this place in Jesus name I bind depression by the authority of the word of God I bind oppression in the name of Jesus Christ hey I lose the joy of the Lord all over this house why don't you take somebody by the hand and raise it up and wave it together Come on. Amen. I'm going to worship together. I'm coming after. I'm coming after a Hinoam and I'm coming after Abigail. I'm going to have a restoration. I'm going to recover everything. I'm going to recover all the stuff. I'm going to recover all the stuff I thought I'd never get back. All the stuff that went up in smoke. I'm coming after it. I'm coming after it. I'm coming after it with my worship. With my praise, with my voice, with my hands, with my feet. I'm coming after my, I want my joy back. Hey, sometimes you got to quit crying and you got to start fighting. Sometimes you gotta quit crying and you gotta start going after it. Now is the time to go after it. Pastor, but Pastor, if I don't feel it, am I being a hypocrite if I shout like I am? If I'm still struggling, am I being a hypocrite if I worship? There was a time when Miriam stood over a dry desert, nothing but rocks and sand, and sand in the middle of that dry desert before there ever was a sign of change. She began to sing, spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. All I see is sand, but somewhere in there is a well. All I see is dryness, but I know down deep there's water. All I see is what happens when the environment is dry, but I know the God of the ground has water in the well for me. So even though I don't see it, and even though I don't feel it, I still say, spring up, oh well. Spring. Sometimes you gotta sing before the water flows. I said, sometimes you gotta sing before there's water. Because it's the singing that gets the water with joy. Shall you draw water out of the well? Somebody praise him right now. Somebody ought to have a Holy Ghost fit right now. You ought to quit 
worrying about what people think. You ought to quit worrying about what it looks like. You ought to quit worrying about everything and just say, spring up a well. I got Satan on my trail, but I'm singing all this well. He's attacking every day, No matter the attack, I won't turn back. This means war. This means war. doctor's report on Friday. He's got some issues with his heart. It caused him to feel really weak and, and low at times. Won't believe God. Amen. We've anointed the prayer cloth. We're going to lay hands on him and believe God for healing right now in Jesus' name. And if you want healing, you just find somebody close and say, hey, I need prayer too in Jesus' name. That's right. In the name of Jesus. By the authority of the Word of God. By the name of Jesus.
Thank you. 